Welcome to the Neovesta Vanguard Specialty Imaging live stream. I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy, reporting from beautiful downtown Sunnyvale, California, near the Apple campus, where a lot of things are happening every day. And today, we are graced again by our friend and TOS expert, Dr. Art Jenkins, from across the coast, uh, New York City. Art gave a talk that was really well received and is highly viewed on our websites. And that is why is thoracic outlet syndrome so hard to diagnose? So Art is gifted in a lot of different fields and he's a, an inventor and innovator. And he's going to talk to us about this talk that we gave over a year ago and updates since that point. Art, welcome to the show again. We're really happy to have you here. Thanks, Scott. Always a pleasure to be here. This is a, you know, it's a great program that you run and you bring in a lot of both luminaries as well as people who actually suffered through this. So it's uh, you do a great job of making this impactful and meaningful. I'm happy to be a participant in any way I can. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Art. That's appreciated. So first, um, standard disclaimers. I have no conflict of interest from anything that I'm pushing. I don't have any patents that are, depend upon this, but I am a surgeon. I do make my living doing surgeries and I get my reputation based upon doing only the ones that are appropriate. So you judge that as best you can. So what is TOS, TOS as some people like to call it? It's a collection of diagnoses. It's no one simple thing that involves impact upon any one of the, or sometimes multiple aspects of the neurovascular bundle. That means the artery, the nerve, the vein that run between the heart and the arm. Now, thoracic T, chest area, outlet O means where stuff runs along, kind of the conduit. And syndrome just means stuff that goes wrong with the first two words. So why is diagnosing thoracic outlet syndrome so hard? It's because it's not just one entity. There's cervical ribs, there's uh, all sorts of other aspects of TOS, ATOS, NTOS, VTOS, there's uh, pec minor syndrome. Um, and then there are subtleties within each component involving what, where the compression is and where it isn't. In addition to that, this happens in an area where a lot of other stuff goes on. It's also hard because different practitioners, neurologists, chiropractors, neurosurgeons, physical therapists, primary doctors, emergency room doctors, lawyers, and you know people who make their living off the workers' comp and other areas, they, in many cases, use different language. They have different ideas, have different philosophies about how you... So this is an area that, because there's no one uniform simple diagnosis and a, a, a canon, so to speak, a, a, a Bible of TOS that everybody relies upon, there are a lot of different ways that people look at it. The imaging is very challenging. It's in an area that Scott and I have discussed many, many times. There are various challenges to acquiring the image, let alone understanding it. And there are so many different types of imaging relying on one over another it can be to the patient and clinician's detriment, but also it can, one may undercall a condition and another may overcall it. So there's a lot of complexity in this tiny little area. The treatment options are very complicated as well because they range from doing nothing to doing surgery. And there is a lot in between of getting from doing nothing to doing surgery. And so understanding what is enough treatment and what is too much treatment is also part of the art of science. And finally, one of the things that really holds back more work in this area, there's no high profile celebrity who's out championing it like Christopher Reeve was for spinal cord injury, Michael J. Fox is for Parkinson's. There's no big pharma that's behind the latest drug 
thoracic outlet syndrome because there really is a drug or even a single target that would work for this. There's no massive not-for-profit that's out there saying, we represent your choice. We're going to lobby Congress to get more TOS coverage, Medicare, Medicaid, insurance companies, and the like. There's no implant that we can really use to make this better. So nobody's patented something that they can make a billion dollars. So nobody's out there pounding the ground trying to get this into that, that next hospital. And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of modern hospitals, pharma, doctors, you know, how they work. They are driven often by somebody who wants to make a profit off of making better treatment option. And you can't profit off what you can't patent. So this is an area that's just underappreciated, underunderstood, and really just, it's an orphan condition in many ways. In my mind, it, it's its really an orphan because nobody is championing it. It really just involves this region right here in the neck between the, the spine and between where the, the nerves, the neurovascular bundle runs out the arm. So it spans from the start of the brachial plexus to the end of the brachial plexus. And that starts above and below the clavicle, which kind of is the, the meridian, the equator of this thoracic outlet region. And that goes from the top of C5, which is where the top nerve comes off, to the surface of the rib cage below and everything in between. So it's a syndrome, so there must be symptoms. And that depends upon what structure is being compressed. And this is where we start getting into the complexity of, well, the different subtypes of TOS. So what is being compressed will determine where it hurts, where it's weak, where it's numb, where there's tingling. Um, and often it's positional based upon where that shoulder, clavicle, all these other different muscles and nerves where they get dragged across something else. And this can cause weakness. It can cause a loss of strength in the muscles permanently if there's nerve damage. It could cause vascular insufficiency. Your, your, the arm could get blue. Um, or it could cause swelling, backup of fluid where the veins, veins outflow is blocked if fluid backs up into the arm. So a wide spectrum of different ways that this can show itself. So this is a, it, it is multiple conditions. And the most important ones that we talk about are ATOS, arterial compression. And that's where this major artery comes off behind the clavicle and it's compressed and squeezed down to a much smaller size. And in some cases, creates a bleb off of it or an aneurysm where it's being rubbed in between the clavicle or first rib, which is the most common place for arterial compression. Venous TOS is very similarly, but where it causes backflow this way. And this part of the vein actually gets blown up and it's smaller on the other side of where the compression occurs when the clavicle is almost scissoring across the first rib. And these are actually from 3D models of a patient with TOS. And then finally, neurogenic TOS or NTOS can be compression anywhere in this range. And it can be compression by the muscles, by scar, it can be compression caused by compression by the clavicle and first rib. It could be caused by compression from an incompetent first rib that's flexing and causing inflammation. There are many different ways and different versions of NTOS can include cervical rib compression and compression by the tendon of the, uh, the uh, pectoralis minor muscle, which runs down here. We'll show a better picture of that shortly. So 
the nerves themselves can get pinched coming in between here, just as the artery and the vein can. They can be pinched by the pectoralis muscle. The, the, the muscle comes down off of the coracoid process, goes down to the second, third, and fourth ribs. And it can get bowstring under this tendon as the nerve then goes out and up out the arm. This in this particular position, the arm is elevated. So the nerve goes, pulls, is pulled down by this tendon and bowstrung up as it goes up the arm. It could be caused by the scalene muscles themselves, which run up in the neck area. And if they get overgrown, or even if some people are born with oversized or too close together muscles, the nerves coming through here can be pinched in between these two muscles. Usually it's the middle and the anterior. Um, you see here for reference where the uh, axillary artery and the subclavian vein come up and join the brachiocephalic vein. Cervical ribs are where you grow an extra rib that pinches the nerve, and that's usually the C7 nerve, which is different than the majority of TOS problems, which present with eighth nerve, C8 nerve, which comes out between C7 and T1. Um, so that's a slightly different variation in the symptoms, and so you really got to listen to what's going on to figure out what is the etiology. Now, it's also complicated. There's a lot of other stuff in this area that can go wrong. There's nerves that can be pinched in the spine itself that irritates the same general nerves. There's tumors, trauma, other inflammatory conditions that involve the brachial plexus nerve so that these nerves can have other problems. In them. You can have pinching in the nerve in the elbow. You can have pinching in the nerve in the, in the wrist carpal and cubital tunnel that can mimic the same symptoms you see in carpal in, uh, in thoracic outlet syndrome. And in fact, sometimes people have both TOS and cubital tunnel or and carpal tunnel. And the question becomes, what do you treat first? Do you treat any? Do you treat all? Um, there's a lot of complexity here. In addition, the shoulder itself. So is there pinching of the nerve because the shoulder's out of alignment and fix the shoulder first and that'll stop the pinching? Or is it even mimicking or just it's causing an irritation that the, the shoulder's the problem, but it's showing up like a nerve pinch? Uh, trauma to the elbow, trauma to the ribs, fracture ribs in this area can also cause irritation on the nerves. So we're just pain in that area. So it's important to understand when you have what sounds like thoracic outlet syndrome, it might not be. And of course, other less than common but known conditions that irritate or inflame anything in this area, vascular sy symptoms can be developed and even rarely vascular symptoms in the pelvis and other parts of the body can cause a shift in the vascular balance through the body and irritate the nerves in the thoracic outlet, causing TOS symptoms. But fixing this problem in a different place has been shown to sometimes fix the TOS symptoms. So it's, it seems that there's something else on the very distant fashion that because it's all connected, brings it back to and, and shows up symptoms in a different area collagen vascular disorders, people who are prone to developing aneurysms, people who are prone to developing vascular or even ligamentous instability can get injuries in this area very commonly. And that makes treating these patients more complex. Sadly, there are many surgeons who just won't touch patients with clear TOS, but they have other underlying conditions that might make their recovery more complex, but they don't want to take on the risk of doing so. Um, and then for similar reasons, sometimes they get referred away from surgery, are told surgery is not an option because of a mistaken conception, you can't have surgery 
if you have one of these other conditions that makes your recovery maybe more complicated, but still potentially worthwhile. So just because you have these doesn't mean you can't move forward with more aggressive treatments. It just means it's a longer conversation that needs to be had. And so sometimes it is more than one diagnosis. Now, we love this thing called Occam's razor. It's, it's when you want to simplify a concept, you pick the simplest solution that makes, that covers all of the symptoms. And sometimes it just doesn't apply. It's not a mandate. And so just because we want to find one unifying diagnosis, sometimes people have elbow problems and TOS problems. Sometimes they have spine problems. They have MS and TOS. It, it's not one or the other. Um, and so that added complexity sometimes pushes clinicians away from wanting to treat because they think, what's the point? I can't cure their MS, so why bother treating their TOS? Or I can't treat their arthritis, but I, can't, I could treat their TOS, but I, I don't. It's just too much trouble. Uh, or they just say, I don't understand it. They push you away and say, oh, it's all in your head or there's nothing we can do for that. And, and there's a reason for that is that most doctors are taught early in their careers, when in doubt, don't. Better to not hurt people than do something you don't understand. And that certainly, I agree with that statement. But sometimes if you're looking for a reason not to do a procedure on somebody who would benefit from it, it just makes it easier to walk away. And I, I don't like walking away from people that I think I can help. I'm just gonna briefly touch on disputed TOS. Uh, Scott and I have talked about this, I think a dozen times at one point or another, uh, the concept of a disputed TOS is what they used to call TOS without EMG findings. And really all disputed TOS is, it's early TOS. It hasn't caused permanent damage. This, is, this disputed TOS is actually the best time to intervene. Why would you wait until they're permanently devastated before trying to make it a little better when you could make it a lot better and just help somebody and keep them from becoming permanently disabled? So these, there's a lot of nihilism about the benefit of treatment options like therapy and surgery. And so that often pushes people into being told, oh, there's nothing we can do for that. So just deal with it. Now, why are they nihilistic? Why do they people say there's not much you can do? And that's because, well, very often short-term outcomes, everything needs to help, at least in one study or another. And so you could find any study that says the least invasive way of managing people should get you better because they typically cherry pick the least involved patients to study in this. Uh, so it's, there's confusion sometimes about what is beneficial. And long-term outcomes, there is a high rate of symptom recurrence. And I think a lot of that goes to the fact that we still haven't fully described the mechanism by which shoulder instability causes that malpositioning of different structures and tension on the neurovascular bundle. Until we have that really locked up and we have a better way of restabilizing the shoulder, it's going to make long-term outcomes less than ideal, but it doesn't mean you don't treat somebody. If you could make somebody pain-free for five years, but their symptoms come back, that's better because then you could treat them again. But if you never treated them, then they just suffered the whole time and they're with no hope of recovery. Uh, and then oftentimes with patients who are out on disability, it seems like they don't do well with surgery. And sometimes there's a financial incentive to not get better and keep getting that money coming in for their disability and why fight that process? Why swim uphill to get better and go back to work if doing nothing gets you free money? Well, another way this is complex 
is that no one physical test is absolute reliable and, and universally accepted for specific tests. And there's a whole list of these tests. The East test, the Adsons, Ruth, you name it, there's somebody's named a test after themselves. And I'll tell you, one of the most useful tests I have doesn't have a name, but it should be, uh, you know, it should be called the, the Newkirk test because he taught it to me. And that's the elevated grip strength that's different from the arm down grip strength. And I find that exquisitely helpful and very sensitive of any type of TOS, but still not 100% sensitive. Um, we look for tenderness. Some patients have tenderness where you'd expect them to, and some don't. Um, some, many arterial and venous TOS patients don't get a classic venous or arterial compression syndrome. And some are what we call compressors, meaning with the arm up, they get worse. And some are what we call releasers with the arm down, they get worse. How do you explain that? It's, it's not easy. And so that complexity and that inconsistency makes some patients get shunted down a non-treatment route rather than uh, let's investigate further. And ultimately, a lot of that comes from either insurance companies trying to cut off the, the testing to reduce their cost and say, oh, give up. It's not going to help. Or it's coming from clinicians who are looking at how long their, their patient list is that day and thinking, I can't spend more than five minutes with this patient or I'm not going to get through my day. So I, I just... Nah, you know what, we're gonna, we'll send you for more PT rather than order more tests. And even some of the tests we get are not terribly useful. The, the, electro, the uh, EMGs often appear normal, even when the patient is very symptomatic. Um, in fact, I've found that any reversible neurologic weakness, if you're weak in one position but not in another, if you're weak at certain times and not at others, it almost never shows up on the EMG. It only shows up when you have weakness 24-7. Um, the SSEPs and MEPs are a different type of electrophysiology, and those actually are probably more sensitive and specific, but they're a very uncomfortable test to perform. There's no clinically accepted process for doing this. It's ex very experimental. Um, However, I, I have done on sleep patients, we monitor routinely, and we've seen significant changes in position. And I did actually try to get one patient to undergo awake testing. I sent them to a reputable big name academic center, and they didn't do it the way I asked them to do it, and it was negative. So what does that say? Well, if you didn't do it right, does it tell you anything? And I think the answer there is no. I think there's more to learn, and I think we just need to find people who are willing to think outside of the box. The imagery is hard to understand, okay? So Scott's a wizard of this. You know, he truly is the wizard of TOS. Uh, but, you know, most people look at his MRIs, and they <laughs> their eyes glaze over, and they go to the report which is then nine pages long and their eyes glaze over again. And they're like, okay, I got nothing. The good news is I've spent a little time with Scott trying to learn from him and understand what all of these different things mean. Um, but MRI, although it's a great, and it's also a non-invasive and non, uh, non ionizing radiation test, isn't the only form of imaging that we have. We do have CAT scans, which could show the bony anatomy. Here's an example showing not just how close the clavicle and first rib can become, but if we look closely here, you can see how this first rib gets scalloped, how it's eroded by the clavicle and the, the pressure of the clavicle on the neurovascular bundle, which is just wearing this rib down. Uh, this is a 3D reconstruction of a patient with uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, and it's... Uh, it just gives you an idea that there are a lot of different ways that you can look at the structures to really get very granular. What's the compression? Where is the compression? What's it doing? 
to the the blood vessels. But this is a CT angiogram. This is a lot of radiation exposure, and it's a lot of um, time in a, in a study. That's, a CT is normally pretty short compared to an MRI, but it can be very uncomfortable having your arms up to recreate the circumstances when your pain is is worst. And that's the position you need to image. And that's the other problem with the uh, EMGs are actually, even with the arm up, are negative if it's a temporary weakness. And it's only the SSAPs and e e MEPs that would be symptomatic and sensitive and only when the arm is in the sensitive position. Some people will use ultrasound for uh, to looking at the vascular uh, flow patterns of the arteries and veins, but those are very sensitive tests and they're very user specific. Usually only the person who's done the study knows what they were looking at because they only they know the exact position and angle and the depth way they were, they were measuring it at. And so they have to do the report themselves on the study they did. It just makes it hard to generalize uh, unless you have uniformity of how these are being interpreted. Um, and then there are studies called for dynamic fluoros images, but they'll show the bony anatomy, but not the vessels and not the nerves. And so they're of limited utility. There's a bigger version of that same image, which we just saw. I find these helpful, but not, a, not for every patient because of the, uh, the amount of contrast that we have to inject and the amount of radiation that it takes to get this high a resolution study, looking at blood vessels and inter inferring what the nerves are. And of course, then the treatments are complicated. It's not just, ah, when in doubt, put it out, because there's a lot of different layers getting to that point. Physiotherapy, bracing, injections, Botox, other uh, forms of uh, interventional injection uh, treatments like hydrodissection. And then when you get into the surgery, there are different problems, and each one has a best surgical option for it. There's and within them, there are supraclavicular, infraclavicular, transaxillary, and costive transversectomy is how I uh, transversectomy is how I do my minimally invasive cervical ribs. It's a completely different approach to how I do my first rib resections, literally coming from the opposite sides of the body. The treatment's complicated and multi-layered, and even if you wanted to just start off with physical therapy, many therapists don't speak the same language. The most widely accepted on the West Coast uh, technique for managing uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, the Edgelo techniques, nobody in the East Coast knows what this means or, or how to do it. Uh, and also what Dr. Tracy Newkirk has been doing for years with his bracing, nobody on the East Coast seems to know how he does it and, and, and what he does to get the great results that he got for so many years. And unfortunately, as he is winding down his, his practice, he's got less bandwidth to be able to help patients going forward. And I'm not sure that that is how effectively that will be passed on to the next generation. Um, now, very few surgeons treat TOS. Most people either haven't heard of it or don't know what to do with it. There are some vascular surgeons, very few neurosurgeons, and very few hand surgeons who do and are willing to do it, but most of them will only treat one aspect. For example, there's some hand surgeons that will only treat pec minor syndrome. There's some vascular surgeons who only treat arterial PCOS and not venous, or, and there's some that do just venous. And so it makes it very balkanized if somebody has multiple aspects, they may be like, I don't do you because that's too complex for me. Um, there are very few specialists who will collaborate Hey, a neuro and a vascular surgeon, either in the evaluation of the patient or in the uh, operative treatment of the patient. And that's unfortunate, but that's kind of a, what's happened in the uh, silos that have developed in big institutions. Vascular surgeons are expected to play with vascular surgeons, and neurosurgeons tend to want to keep the cases within neurosurgery 
when you look at it from a department down silo. Um, we, they pay lip service to wanting to collaborate, but in reality, it's often hard to collaborate both with scheduling and in terms of just shared interest or shared language. Uh, and so that makes it less likely to cross pollinate. Um, and so it's just not a lot of innovation in this space. So because of the different perspectives and the different experience, different ways people look at it, and the fact that some doctors treat their patients like their personal property and don't share them, don't send them to somebody else who does something different. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if all you ever do is transaxillary rib resection for, for TOS, when you see TOS, that's all you're ever going to do. And that's if you all ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you've ever gotten. Now, the thrombosis of venous TOS often returns because when the veins have been compressed for long enough, you can get scar on the inside. And those scar and sensations that develop act like a filter that catch clots and can promote more clot forming, especially if there are rough edges in these little scar-like bands that are pulling the vein tighter together, even after the bones are no longer compressing. Um, and the treatments need to be improved to manage the underlying cause. The Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, or EDS, has some type of genetic uh, association with it, but it's just not well understood, at least not for the hypermobility type that seems to be associated with a lot of the cases of TOS that they see. The scapular stability, as I said, 17 different muscles support the scapula. Not every patient has the same injury. One of the reasons why not every patient has the same symptoms. But most of the treatments we have are just assuming one size fits all because they think TOS is one size. And it's just not the case. We know that there is so much more to TOS and to the mechanism of the injury. But imagine if how hard it is to get people to do EMGs in TOS because they're not terribly useful. Now, how hard do you think it would be to get patients to agree to undergo and EMG doctors and technicians to attempt to identify the muscular irritations in 17 different muscles that all go around that entire shoulder blade area? It's, it's almost insurmountable. So what we need to do is to understand and find ways to collaborate both in the research space and the clinical space and the, and the patient advocacy space to really get a better understanding for all of these conditions, come up with the least invasive way of managing a particular patient at a particular point uh, and implement this information across all the platforms, across physiotherapy across the pain management, across the vascular surgeon, across the ER, across you know, to wherever they're being treated and being identified to primary doctors and, and to chiropractors and get everybody to buy in that at this stage, this is the right way to treat it. At this stage, this is the right way to treat it. And when you get this far down the rabbit hole, these are the remaining options you have. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, if you look at each separate area of complexity I've discussed so far, the number of branch points that we're seeing looks less like a spider web and more looks like a neural map of the brain, with potentially billions of uh, connections and iterations and different options on how we can treat this. I think that ultimately we can prune it down and, and kind of lump different situations a little better and i think it will eventually be able to understand the mechanics of the scapular instability better and, and potentially since not every muscle operates in the unique direction we talk about there are six degrees of movement of a body that can be moved and so that involves you know we call it xyz pitch roll and yaw and so of six ranges of motion, 17 muscles, there's redundancy. So we may be able to lump some of the muscles together and an injury here 
and an injury here and might be treated the same, whereas an injury at this end. Three o'clock position on the scapula might be treated completely different from an injury at the nine o'clock position on the scapula. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and, and getting advocates for patients together to do this uh, is really the best way. Um, I will address some of the comments in, that are popping up as I when I get to the end, uh, which is soon. We're actually getting close to the end. So be patient with me, but keep popping up those comments and questions. So one of the points that I often make is using the wrong treatment will make another condition worse, as well as not adequately treat the primary problem. So first rib, rib resection won't help pec minor syndrome or cervical rib problems, but it might actually destabilize the area and cause the clavicle to fall further, which could make pectoralis minor syndrome worse. Thrombosis and VTOS needs to be treated and prophylaxis and potentially maybe even stented to prevent repeat thrombosis. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a, a guarantee, but this is a, uh, a thought that's been kicked around by some of the people that I know who are worried about not just how do we treat TOS, but how do we treat TOS patients going forward. Arterial TOS requires treatment of the aneurysm or the arterial stenosis. Um, so we've really got to make sure we've eliminated that and done so safely and effectively. Um, and if the problem is coming from the scapular instability and we don't find some way to address that post-op, if you don't get the right therapy or if you don't get any therapy after you've been had the, the problem uh, addressed primarily, you're just going to wind up sliding further down the slope and you might very well go from first rib compression to second rib compression because the scapula just keeps falling. Now, industry and treatment centers of excellence often drive so-called innovation in an area like this. So can a drug or device be patented to treat this condition? You know, maybe. I mean, got, I'm an optimist, okay? I mean, I've got several patents of my own on some dif dis dif disparate areas of interest, ranging from spinal tumors to preventing spinal cord injury to uh, coming up with novel or less invasive ways of doing what is normally a large open standard operation. So I I'm always on the lookout for new ways, and I will always hope that someone maybe not me, but someone will come up with a better way of doing this and maybe an implant will be involved. But most of what we're looking at here is taking pressure away. And there's no implant that we do that acts like a vacuum. Cleaner. It's, it's a procedure to remove stuff. And that means without an implant, J&J &J isn't that interested, Medtronic's not that interested, none of these companies. If there isn't a patent, there isn't profit. Um, there's no drug we can inject in there that's going to make this go away. There are people who are, I'm sure are trying stem cells, but like most of the other off-label, because everything's off-label for stem cells, but most of the other off-label indications for stem cells, there's no proof that they work for these types of entities. Um, I'm not making a blanket statement that stem cells can't help people. I think that someday stem cells are going to be a critical part of future medicine. It's just not a big player in 2023 medicine. Now, one of the things that people like to do is they like to go to a place where they do a lot of something. Okay. Major studies have shown aneurysms should be like brain aneurysms. I'm a neurosurgeon, so I think about brain things. Brain aneurysms should are best clipped at a place that does a lot of brain aneurysms, right? You don't want to go to the guy who's clipped three or four of these in his career and say, that's the guy I want to clip my aneurysm. If, you, if you're in an emergency and there's nobody else there, the neurosurgeon is going to be trained in it, but it might not be the thing he does regularly. We all know if you want something done well, you generally want it done by somebody who's done enough of them to know how how to do it now for that complication. So high volume centers tend to have lower complication rates. And so centers of excellence get developed where you standardize procedures, where the hospital can take 
potentially a marginally profitable procedure and ramp up high volume like a factory and really crank out a lot of these. So heart valves, stenting, these are things where you do the same thing over and over. It gets a lot easier to do it in high volume. So if the margins are small, you can still make it up in volume. But the problem with TOS is it's not one size fits all procedure. And so it's not clear that going to a high volume factory like location is gonna give you the complexity of analysis to say, yeah, you know what? It sounds like TOS, but it's actually a cervical rib. When they know that they've got to crank through, you know, 50 patients in their clinic in a day to get enough patients on the OR schedule to do it again next week. Um, so you really got to make sure that you're going to get treated at a place that knows how to do it by people who do enough of it to be comfortable with it, but not somebody who's just going to knee jerk. You got TOS, you're getting this. You got TOS, you're getting this. Why? Because that's what I do for everybody with TOS. So the factory model works great if you're making widgets, but doesn't work very well if you're trying to crank out very complex different iterations, even of the same general concept. So where do we go from here? Well, I think that I, as a clinician, say, I got to take time to listen to my patients. I got to understand what's their mechanism of, of injury, what's their mechanism of pain and, and dysfunction induction. And that's very hard in this current environment of HMOs, Obamacare, Medicare. Reimbursements for physicians have dropped precipitously. Medicare, for example, uh, the cost of the payments to physicians has dropped by about 40% over the last 20 years. And the last year, it's actually even more dramatic than that because they, they cut not just the amount they pay doctors, they said, well, we were going to cut you 10%, but we only cut you 2%. Wait a sec. That's when inflation is 7 to 8%, that we, we've lost 8% on the value of the dollar, and now you're going to cut us $2, 2% more. But then they also cut all the value of a lot of procedures, so they aren't even as worth as much as they were before. So they took another 10% haircut on the back end that, that most people don't even know happened to them. So they, people are basically looking at, I got to do 20% more surgeries just to keep up with where I did last year. So I got to crank out 20% more patients in clinic. Something's got to give. It's probably going to be the time they spend with you or the time you spend with the doctor. You're going to be spending that time with a PA or an MD or a resident or a physician extender of some other kind or a medical student. And listen, they're all smart people but they're not the board certified expert. They're, they want to be, or they work for one, but they didn't do a full five, seven, eight years of residency of fellowship training yet. They're on their way, or they're working for someone who did, but they're not the name. So you really got to make sure that you're treating each patient where they are and not just treating them as a pigeonhole of your TOS. Okay, we'll set you up for a first rib resection for next week by X technique, because that's what this doctor does. We need better research on existing treatments, and we really need people who are working together to collaborate on doing this. And to get that, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes money. Why? I really don't have time to do it on my own. I actually hire my own private research team. I have I employ my own research team. Most private practices don't. Many academic centers don't have these type of research team because it's just not cost effective. But that's not why I do what I do. Um, we need better modeling, which means we need to work with industry and tech people to help us to model these things, create those, not just the 3D models, but 4D models. We have to look at what's the evolution of these structures over time. And then let's come up with some new treatment modalities. 
let's encourage people to invent something new. Let's encourage people to come up with a new treatment, a new surge, as some have done, uh, and as well as or potentially a new drug or injection or a stem cell treatment or a new gene enhanced therapy that will change the balance. Let's, let's, let's get busy. Now, I've often said that seeing is believing, but believing is necessary for seeing. So you will never make a diagnosis that you don't believe in. You'll never make a diagnosis you're not looking for. You will never make a diagnosis that if you were never taught what, how to do it or, or how to look at it. So if you're not aware and actually not looking for it, you won't see it. So many people only want diagnose what they see regularly or what they want to treat. And they just say, you know what? That's not in my wheelhouse. Why don't you go see somebody else? Well, that's just wasting your time and their time. We talked a little bit about the TOS issues. Um, and unfortunately, occasionally, patients get pigeonholed with fibromyalgia. There's a pain somewhere I don't understand. And the problem is many patients who get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, it's almost like a stigma. It's almost a, 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 it's a stigma that says this person can't be made better. We can only give them drugs. There's nothing that can be treated surgically, medically, injection-wise. It's just fibromyalgia. Nothing more to do here. Just make them comfortable and just tell them to deal with it. And a lot of times, I mean, I, I actually have seen it written up that and published 10% of patients with fibromyalgia actually have a Chiari malformation at their brain cell interface, <laughs> let alone <coughs> TOS. Bertolotti syndrome, May Thurner syndrome, and so many other syndromes that you, somebody just didn't think of. And so when they didn't, they, it wasn't one of the top five diagnoses they treat. They said, oh, must be fibromyalgia. So sorry for you, ma'am, sir. So sorry for you, sir. We'll give you some medication. And whether it works or not, it's all we can do for you. So should it be so hard? Should it be hard to find a practitioner who understands the multiple etiologies and compression points, who can diagnose the overlap between orthopedic and neurologic conditions, who understands the complexity and balance of different opinions, who can order and interpret the different imaging and testing, who understands the complexity of the different treatment options, and who isn't relying on industry or a factory model to drive their interest in treating a condition. Actually, that does sound pretty hard in this current day and age where everybody seems to shun complexity because complexity is the enemy of profitability. So what should you do as an informed patient? Keep trying. Keep trying. If that doesn't work, keep trying. Don't give up until you find someone who will both take your concerns seriously and help develop a plan how to manage the symptoms. They've got to get it. They got to have a plan for it. And that plan has to have a start and an end that they move you on to a next stage once they've exhausted what they could do for you. So they've got to understand the workup, you as a patient need to understand that the workup may be extensive and require uncomfortable imaging and testing. Um, I will say that Scott's MRI, nobody ever comes to me and says, Doc, that was the best MRI I've ever had. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant. It's meant to be because we need to image the patient in the most uncomfortable position because that gives us the most information about where the compression points are, where the irritation points are, where the pain points are. And without that, it's useless. So sorry, but it's sorry, not sorry. So ultimately, you need to be prepared to work hard to avoid surgery and then to recover hard after surgery if necessary. Because if you don't restabilize and resupport those 17 muscles on the scapula, you're going to be coming back with more problems down the road. 
I thank you for your interest and attention. I think now's a good time for us to start looking at some of the questions in the, uh, in the chat. All right. I'm going to interrupt here. Thank you. Awesome talk. Um, I will say this. I was having trouble keeping up, taking notes on all you said. There's a lot of density in there. And <laughs> Sorry I about that. I tried to speak slowly. I guess not. No, you did. You presented great. It's just I have a bunch of uh, points I want to reinforce that you made and questions I have to ask. But let's take a few questions from some of our patients first. Um, Sonia J. Can the rare aberrant muscles called subclavius posticus or hypertrophic omohyoid muscles cause neurogenic TOS? I had to stop swimming years ago due to altered sensations and pain in the, uh, I presume, upper extremity in the arms with freestyle. So this is a great question because it hits on some of the things uh, I often discuss. Uh, absolutely, aberrant muscles can contribute to or cause neurogenic TOS. We see this everywhere else throughout the body, right? Or, you know, Anconia uh, epicroparis, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. There are variant muscles that attach to tendons and take up space. So the concept of an entrapment neuropathy is that nerves have to have all these free tunnels and channels throughout the body to get from where they start to where they finish. And surgeons like Art, like Dr. Jenkins, will see these patients who come with a neuropathy, an entrapment neuropathy, because they have an extra muscle where your funny bone is, not supposed to be there, you're just born with it. And then you play too much tennis or too much lacrosse or whatever, and now that nerve gets irritated. Right. You, you see a lot of these cases, I'm sure. Yep. No, it, it, there's no question that having different congenital situations or having an aberrant growth of a muscle can uh, absolutely cause compression. And it really comes down to, well, where's the pain and what's it coming from? And that's where you got to find somebody who's going to take the time to inspect the different areas. And if you say, hey, it hurts when I push here and the doctor doesn't try pushing there, <laughs> you got to find somebody who will because they may not want to push there because they don't understand what goes on here. And so they may not, you know, the, the omohyoid muscle actually is a, runs as a sling and it comes out this way. And so if they don't follow it around and don't understand that where that can possibly cross some of these areas, it's not going to make any sense to even waste your time talking to them. So the, the answer is, these are all, the word can, absolutely. Does it? I think that depends on the individual patient. And that's something that I can't answer in this medium. But, uh, you know, it's certainly uh, one needs to always keep one's mind open to the possibilities. I don't know the answer to every question, but I almost laugh every time I hear somebody say, no, that can't cause X. Or I've because never heard of once, that. Yeah, I mean, God has a sense of irony, and 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 you know, if you believe in God, has a sense of irony that loves to prove people wrong. So, as to the subclavius posticus in particular, there are about ten papers in the literature, actually less than ten, that describe the muscle. And I can tell you, I see it with much more frequency than you would believe from the medical literature. And when that muscle contracts. If it's a subclavius posticus, it is going to contract the wrong direction and pull down on the brachial plexus. So absolutely, you can do bow stringing. Art mentioned this before as regards the pectoralis minor. Um, I have not ever seen, and I've not in my practice or in the literature, an omohyoid muscle contributing. Um, so I tend to think it doesn't. But when you do an MRI, as I do, one of the things we look for is all the variants of the path of the brachial plexus, all the variant muscles. And just as Art said, can I show that muscle pressing on that nerve? And then when I report it back to a doc like Dr. Jenkins, does he say this matches my clinical exam? And that's crucial. Thank you for a very good question. And, and just to the flip side of what you were just saying, though, is that you see it more frequently but maybe it's not symptomatic. That's we right. know that 40% of people walking around on the street with no pain at all in their back, if we get an MRI of their low back, we can find something wrong with it. But 
it's asymptomatic and, ir and ir irrelevant. So that's, that's a great point to know bring that up. it's there and we know it can predispose as a potential point of compression. And frequently those types of things are symptomatic when something else pushes in a different direction. And now you're meeting in the middle instead of having more room because you don't have that post, uh, that subclavius yep. posticus. So it's, um, it's the kind of thing that might not just innately cause, but it might predispose you to getting it if you have a second hit to the system. Now, I'm sure you've been accused of being a smart guy. I've done it myself. And I know that when you order an MRI or a CAT scan of the spine, you're going to look at it yourself. And you're going to say, on my exam, the patient had a left-sided radiculopathy at this level. Does that match? You don't care if you see a herniation the opposite side, the wrong level, right? And Generally, we, no. As radiologists, we know that. We describe what we describe. We don't make judgments. Sometimes I'll get a history for an MRI art that says radiculopathy, and I really wish I knew which side it was on and which level, because I can't help, you know. Um, so in that case, I just objectively describe things, but I can't say, here's, this fits together. But then hopefully that doc on the other end, like if it were you, you would do that. So all imaging has to work as teamwork. But the point I want to make here is TOS particularly because of the complexity requires for the best outcome, for the best diagnosis, people like Art and I working together. It's Art's specialty is not radiology and mine is far from the high level of surgery he performs. So we need to take the best of what we have and make it work. So that's one of my contributions to how do patients go ahead and get the best diagnosis. All right, soapbox off. All right. Ontario, yeah. I saw this question here before. Is there a type of exploratory surgery to visualize what is being compressed? I'll let you go first on this one, Art. Uh, I got to tell you, I hate doing exploratory surgery. I've done it a few times, but it's never truly exploratory. I have a hypothesis. I see mm -hmm. something that I'm maybe not sure, but I think the clinical diagnosis is so clear. The, the radiologic findings may be unclear, but at least suggestive. Uh, I will almost always order more imaging before I will just cut open and just hope for the best. In, in general, we call exploratory surgery the peak and shriek the because one. you don't know what you're going to find when you get in there. I do not like not knowing what I'm going to find. What I like knowing what I'm going to find, and I would say 99% of the time, I find what I'm looking for because I don't go in unless I'm that sure I'm going to find it. So as far as exploratory surgery goes, once you cut open an area, you've changed it permanently. You're going to create scar where the old tissue was. Right. And so it's not something we do lightly. You, everything you operate around, you put at risk. So doing exploratory surgery around the neurovascular bundle means... You could hurt the neurovascular bundle. You could make it worse. So if you don't have a good rationale for going there, don't go there. So the, the long answer is almost never. The shorter answer is not really. Now I'm going to hop on a little soapbox again, and I apologize for these. I opinionate on these things, and I try to be fair based on my knowledge base and my experience. There are people in the country um, with many different thoughts on TOS. And uh, some of them don't think you need any imaging except an X-ray. Now, I obviously, because I'm so deeply involved in what I do, I don't accept that. I think we can do better than just an X-ray or even just a plain old MRI of the brachial plexus. So when some surgeons go to surgery for TOS without any imaging beyond an X-ray, I I just consider that exploratory. It stuns me, and I'll be honest about this, I don't think it's supported in the literature, and I don't, don't believe it's supported by the practice of medicine in general, that we do a complex surgery, and these surgeons are doing complex surgery, good for them, but how do you do complex surgery without imaging ahead of time? In this country, we're guilty of over-imaging. Why would we not do imaging? We have the tools that work in patients with TOS. It's such a complex area. As Dr. J mentioned, 
there's all these variants of anatomy and there's all these variant syndromes. Why would you not want to know that ahead of time? So I would say there are places where people do exploratory surgery without adequate preparation. And I do not agree with that. All right. I, I will say your mileage may vary. But would you want to go on a clandestine mission into unknown territory without even a map? You're really going to trust the local guide to direct you to the right place? Or would you like to go in with a GPS guide and an X marks the spot virtually so when you get to where you need to be, you know you're there and you've got a picture of your target? It, it just doesn't make sense, and it's uh, to, to me at least. Obviously, yeah, it makes sense to somebody where they wouldn't do it. And, it's, right. you know, there's no limit. What I would say, there is no limit what a relatively, I almost don't want to use the word because it's so pejorative, but uh, there's no limit to what desperate patients will do to try yeah. to get better. Yeah, and we feel for those patients. They're rushing because they're, they're struggling, they're suffering, and it's been long. And, and they don't see any other alternative. Yeah, they want to believe. They meet a doc who will go ahead and do something, and they right. really want to believe. They invest faith, and that's a positive, but we, we caution against that. You know, I bring up the story of appendicitis. Then when docs used to diagnose, even when I was in training, appendicitis by a clinical exam, they were went to too many surgeries 15% of the time and not enough surgeries 15% of the time. And in the late 90s, a radiologist at uh, Harvard, MGH, started doing CAT scans on all these patients and he changed it entirely. And now we're wrong about 3% of the time, which is a huge difference. That's reducing 15% to 3%. So that's 80% reduction in not productive surgeries, meaning the wrong either not to go to surgery or to go to surgery in the wrong situations. So we're still not perfect with CAT scan, but we're way, way better with appendicitis. We should be able to apply this technology to TOS, obviously. I believe we do. All right. Are we done with that? My, thank you for the question. I don't know if you expected yeah, that. Much of an that answer. Added, but... Thank you. Sue, hi. How much can rheumatoid arthritis, Art, you've brought this up, affect a diagnosis of TOS? And thank you for having these live sessions on TOS. Sue, thank you. Um, we've seen you before. Thank you very much for your loyalty. I want to remind everybody, please hit the like button. The algorithm depends on that. And we're really trying to grow and meet new patients. And please subscribe and hit the little bell next to subscribe so you get updated every time. Hit the little bell and it'll say, you know, send me a notice whenever something happens. It'll say show all. And for us, we're getting close. We're just under 800 and we really want to hit 1,000 subscribers. So like and subscribe. All right, Art, rheumatoid arthritis. So I look at it as two different issues in the same patient. So... The, having rheumatoid arthritis makes you maybe a little more susceptible to having TOS. You can have a very arthritic first uh, rib uh, to your to your uh, the to the sternal manubrial junction, and you could have a very arthritic uh, uh, clavicular sternal junction, and then that area can be very inflamed and be more likely to cause compression. I think that it's. When you have the symptoms of TOS, you have nerve compression symptoms. Having rheumatoid arthritis just means that it's from a different etiology than somebody, say, who has hyperflexibility or who had trauma. But it still is a TOS diagnosis. And then the question becomes, does it change your prognosis? Does it change the value of treatment to that individual patient? And that's where it gets down into a discussion between the doctor and the patient about, well, how does rheumatoid arthritis impact? So, for example, if you are on immunomodulators, and so we just have to discuss, well, having surgery, having an incision, and being on immunomodulators or steroids or other treatment, how does that impact your recovery? How does your other rheumatologic problems impact upon your recovery and your ability to participate in therapy? How does the impact on your other joints impact the likelihood of you having other, what we call double crush, or in some cases, triple crush syndrome, where you have a TOS problem 
and a cervical and a cubital tunnel problem and or, or, or a wrist problem, a, a carpal tunnel problem. And so what is your prognosis from treatment? How much better can we offer you if you have multiple compressions going on at the same time? Do we need to address all three? So does that mean if we're going to treat the TOS we, and you want to see more improvement, you're going to have to get it, the, the, the cubital tub treated as well. And when I say treated, I don't necessarily mean operated. I mean treated knowing that surgery is the essentially the end of that train ride. And if you aren't getting better at stop one, stop two, stop three on that train ride, surgery may be that last stop you get to, to get better. So the, the question becomes, where do we go? What are the options available? And that's an individual discussion, not a blanket discussion. And I, and I think that that's a, a fair question to ask because it's not a blanket no. It's a, well, let's talk about the relative aspects and your the impact it will have on you based on your details, because the details do matter. Thank you, Sue. Great question. Roy, uh, all right, this is gonna be a, line, uh, a minefield. How valid are the core TOS and SVS criteria from our point of view? So um, SVS is Society for Vascular Surgery, and they, um, you know, vascular surgeons do a lot of this surgery because they work on aneurysms or venous blood clots, so arterial aneurysms and venous blood clots in this area. So they have more than average uh, understanding of the anatomy and how to get in and out. But they have a different viewpoint on neurogenic TOS. The core TOS, actually before it was ever published, I was part of the first steering committee of a group, Core TOS, that tried to get a nationwide multicenter study on thoracic outlet syndrome. And it was surgeons, it was a lot of other docs, it was one radiologist, just me, and I was on the steering committee, and we could not agree on using any imaging except for x-ray. And I was outnumbered, so the vote, it was just voted down. Uh, we did not get the grant from the National Institutes of Health. Core TOS was later published without me being a part of it. Um, and so here's what Sorry. they say for arterial TOS, CT angiogram, MR angiogram, you know, advanced imaging. That's pretty rare, by the way, like 1% of all TOS patients. And it's not hard to diagnose. Venous TOS, which is 2 to 5% of all TOS patients, they said, you know, MR venogram, CT venogram, direct venogram. But again, that's, you know, using advanced imaging, but it's not hard to diagnose. So 95% of cases are neurogenic TOS. And I presume, Roy, this is your, the focus of your question. So for that, they don't recommend advanced imaging. They'll recommend a chest X-ray or cervical spine X-ray. And um, I got a big problem with that. Now, it may be because they've never had a radiologist show them valuable images, images they think have value. But if they looked in the radiology literature and they certainly, a lot of them know me, and I'm an advocate for this, they certainly have to know that there's a possibility that there's effective imaging out there. They will say, if you drag them into an argument, many of them will say, well, MRI is not perfect. Here's one paper I found from Finland, a guy named Juvenin. I, I've had this paper thrown at me. And uh, so there, you know, it's not perfect, so I'm just going to hold off. So Art showed you before a list of tests that are used clinically. Those tests maybe 30 to 50% accurate, that's the bar for imaging. If we're better than 50%, we should be being used. We're not perfect, don't have to be perfect, no test. The appendicitis CT scan is awesome, and yet it's not perfect. So perfection should not be the bar. So core TOS is used by a lot of people around the world. They don't recommend any kind of imaging. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I do this imaging, but I strongly believe I contribute to a team to help patients do better. We know there's a lot of variability. MRI has been shown in the radiology literature to document all the anatomy in the area and the differences between normal people and patients with TOS. Pulling one paper out of Finland does not answer the question. There's dozens or hundreds of papers in radiology that show its value. So I disagree with core TOS, and I don't think it helps patients. All right, Art, like my soapbox number three today? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, listen, I, I agree with you 100% that it's that the, the not including imaging is kind of like saying, yeah, let's just carpet bomb instead of send snipers in to take out somebody who's causing us a problem. Uh, it's just, it's missing the point of advancing technology and really focusing on where the problem is coming from rather than just, I mean, you might as well just be doing exploratory surgery by if you follow those criteria. By the same token, they have some, some interesting ideas, but the whole purpose was of core was to come up with something that would predict 90% of people falling in some criteria. But, you know, using like pain catastrophizing scores, I, I don't think in this day and age is a particularly useful criteria. And that's part of the core. The SVS is a much broader approach, but it's also meant to be all inclusive. And so it's, it's almost, it's too cumbersome to use on a daily basis. Um, so it, it, they each have some utility. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you tailor different aspects of each of the different uh, criteria, and if you use some for one patient and different parts for another patient, it, you can use it and not spend so much time that you can't treat more than three patients a day, but still spend the right time with them to be clear based upon, well, I don't need to go looking at the cervical rib because their pain is classically a C8 distribution or vice versa. So it, it, you really need to make sure that you're not just, you know, trying to do everything because you don't have the insight to own your your attention yep. and your your focus onto the, the real likely suspects. If you just bring everybody in and interrogate them all and waterboard them all, you'll get 20 confessions from 50 suspects. But do you really want to get 20 confessions when only one of them did it? I, and I don't you don't know which you don't know which one of the 20 it is. Correct. So I, I, you notice that I'm not saying stop doing clinical exams. I'm saying not at all. force clinical exam with imaging. We have the tools. We have the capabilities. So, um, yeah, it's a bugaboo for me. And, you know, as a patient, we always advise the patients to contact us. You don't have to get our study, but go see a doc who knows TOS, who knows us, and let them decide clinically first whether you have TOS. So we work with people. We believe we're part of a team. But I, yeah, I'm frustrated that there are published criteria that a lot of people use that I think goes against the literature that's already out there. I, I honestly, I'd be shocked if most people use that criteria and only that criteria. Hmm. It's they're just they're published criteria, and to a certain extent, sometimes you just publish criteria because that was the best consensus you yeah. could draw. Yeah. And then you update them over time. And they they think it's better to have some consensus than no consensus. And so they couldn't reach consensus. That doesn't mean that the people and the outliers are wrong. It just means that sometimes the people who were in the the common area just said, I don't want to consider the outlying issues. As long as they grow. As you get new data, you can change, modify. And and you can always come back and ask to be included in the consensus Mm -hmm. the next Mm -hmm. time they get around to doing a consensus (laughs) statement. And hopefully, you know, we'll have better data to support it going forward. Yep. (laughs) Unfortunately, I've gotten too loud about it. All right. Humanity first. I'm pretty sure I have it. I also have EDS, but I've only been diagnosed with radiculopathy. Okay. And... I've been diagnosed with cervical instability via upright MRI. Does that have to do with TOS and EDS? So this is a multi-layered question, Art. You're up. Oh, boy. So EDS and cervical instability is a whole different can of worms. And sometimes it's in patients who also have TOS. Um, So yes, but that's actually more of a true, true unrelated uh, and that requires proper attention to, well, what are the symptoms? Do you have symptoms of cervical instability? Is it just you've got excess rotation on the study, or is it when you have excess rotation, you get certain symptoms regularly, or you notice that if your head is held in a particular position, certain symptoms come on. Those symptoms may be brain fog. Maybe 
hearing, vision, facial symptoms, something that doesn't seem quite right for a cervical problem, how would it be affecting your head? And it's, it's doing so if it's EDS, craniocervical instability, it might be doing so through irritation of the sympathetic chain. And that's a separate entity from TOS. It's much higher than TOS, but it's it's the common factor here is the EDS can predispose you to either one. Uh, and so, yes. Hmm. It's challenging for sure. Hopefully you have it strong is. diagnoses, humanity first, of the cervical instability and the EDS. You know, if those are really- And I hope you get to somebody who can treat it. Thank you for the question. Ontario, I've been monitored for the past four years with yearly arterial venous Dopplers, but it's done with me laying supine with my arms at rest by my side. Is this enough to monitor dynamic vascular issues? I think you just answered the question in your question. You it's a non-dynamic study of dynamic issues. If you have dynamic symptoms, it certainly sounds like, yeah, you should really be imaging in with the arms in the position of maximum symptoms. That doesn't make sense to just image at rest. That's kind of like saying, well, you know, you were accused of speeding. Right now your car is parked, so you couldn't have done it. So the uh, two points I'll make, uh, I'll just reinforce arts. Uh, ultrasound is actually great for this because if you have a sonographer who knows what he or she is doing, they can get you to the position where you are symptomatic. So besides you laying supine with your arms by your side, you can sit upright. You can lean to one side. You can have your arm at 90 degrees in front of you or overhead. So that's a great- Whatever position is the pain generator that's where we want to image and insinate yeah. and compare it to where you're not symptomatic. So doing the imaging with the supine is fine as a baseline. And then you compare that to what's it like when your arm is here? What's it like when your arm is here? What's it like when your arm is here standing? Because standing is a totally different position than supine. I, I will tell you that I did this actually with, um, with, with the MEPs and SSEPs, I had a patient on the table where we were, we had the arm down and they had no change. Their SSEPs were a baseline. We raised the arm up on the, on the table and the arm had no change in the, in the monitor. Okay, even though they were symptomatic with their arm up, but they're still lying down on a table on their back. They're still mm -hmm. super gravity is not pulling the arm down gravity is pulling the arm back and so when i put a little bit of gentle traction to it, it's just to emulate the weight of the arm all of a sudden the ssup started falling out yeah, that's and cool. so it's this it's not just the arm position but it's also the body mechanics because there's a profound different mechanical stress on that shoulder region when you're vertical than when you're supine on your back. It's just, it's not the same if you don't measure it in the exact position of symptoms. And our last question by Humanity First. Remember, Humanity First had cervical, uh, craniocervical instability diagnosed by an upright MRI, I believe. So that's one of the uses of upright MRI, which does not produce great quality images, but it's tremendously valuable for just that purpose, showing gravity and motion. So yes, um, one more point I'll add is that uh, ultrasound of the blood vessels, either the arteries or the veins, just like an AdSense test that's done in your doctor's office, those do not rule in or rule out neurogenic TOS. It's just a bad substitute. Now, if they're looking for arterial TOS or venous TOS, that's different, but don't let a purely vascular test of the blood vessels affect the decision on neurogenic TOS. And thank you for the questions. All right. James Shepard says and asks, how tricky can it be to differentiate CRPS from TOS? 
do you see many patients who have both? And thank you for this talk. Thanks, James. I hope you're subscribing and liking. And Art, what do you think? Um, yes, it's going to be very tricky. Uh, after all, CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, for those of you who don't know the acronym, is also the, the old, uh, uh, the, the, we've been talking about this as a type of chronic nerve injury. Um, TOS tends to be more of a reversible or positional problem, um, although it can leave you with permanent nerve damage as well. Um, whereas CRPS is, is more of a chronic continuous irritation, and it can be very difficult to, to separate these. In this particular case, we sometimes get a little help from injections into the stellate ganglion or other parts of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, sometimes, not always. We also can look at blood flow in the, in the limb and whether it has different impact. Um, so there are a number of different ways to try to differentiate it, but no one, um, there's no one yes and no. It's, you got to listen. You got to dig deep into what the story is and really understand the differences between the different pain generators. And then you got to get the imaging and, and sometimes it's both. And so sometimes somebody with CRPS can also have TOS. And that doesn't mean you don't treat the TOS. It just means you manage the expectations on what that outcome looks like. Thank you, James. Uh, Angela Porcelli, Porcelli or Porcelli, I need advice from both of you. Oh, wonderful gentlemen. Thank you so much. Can I join you live sometime? I need some advocates and both of you together would be perfect with what's going on. Okay. Um, First of all, Angela, for your privacy and to respect your personal health information, uh, we'd have to take several steps before we considered having you on um, to discuss your personal health. Uh, we can, though, through our website, help you in a lot of ways. We offer a, a low price consult service with me directly. Um, I'm happy to go over your records with you and what treatment and diagnosis you've had so far and help you understand from a 30,000 foot, uh, 30, foot point of view, where you are in the process and who you can see next. Uh, we're glad to connect you through that with doctors like Dr. Jenkins. And we always believe that even an expert like Dr. Jenkins, you can talk to more than one doctor that's advocating for yourself. Um, I'll, so let's do it off this on our website, which is uh, www.tosmri.com. The last menu on the right will say something like TOS education, and you can contact us there. And we're very responsive and we're happy to talk to you. Um, I want to go over a couple points for advocates. And Art, you can help with this because I'm taking it kind of from your talk. Um, you, you talked about where do we go from here? And I was taking notes about what you were saying because we obviously agree about so much. So you said try harder and try harder. And if that doesn't work, try harder. We totally totally believe that the best patients results come from their own advocacy. They have to advocate for themselves. We have a new video up on our homepage, actually, that's a few of our selected patients who agreed to talk about their main strength through all this thing. And it was standing up for themselves. Now that's hard for a lot of reasons, as Dr. J was saying, um, you need to be able to research, right? Everybody says I research on the internet, but you need to know what sources you're getting it from. So, uh, you know, everyone goes to social media and they see a Facebook group or they get a doc somewhere in a, a different place who gives advice on various disorders. And, you know, that's not always the best source. It's not just the number of sources you get. If you're going to go to social media, please be careful. We always say that. And please reach out to us. We'll help you get in touch with all the docs you want that we know in the field. And those are doctors who've gone usually to good quality medical schools and much training after medical schools. And they're usually doing TOS like Dr. J is because they care. It's not the easiest patient population to help. So know where you're getting your sources. And finally, you know, we do this MRI. Okay, obviously I advocate for it. Someone will tell you, well, Scott's just making money. Well, we spend a lot of time with patients. And yes, we have to charge for what we do. But we have other levels of service we provide. And we're glad 
to help each and every patient. So Angela, we feel you, we understand you need help. Glad to hook you up with Dr. J. He's great to talk to. And if you want to talk to us separately, we're glad to do it. Please reach out to us through our website. Anybody can do this and we'll steer you to the right people. Thank you. Samantha. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Worden. Oh, is anyone creating braces similar to Dr. Newkirk's? Um, and then another question added on. Any idea? Thanks, James. Any idea whether Dr. Newkirk has progressed with development and production of his TOS vest? Um, Art, I don't know if you can help. I, I can help a bit. Please, please go ahead. I, I don't have any specific insight into this. I, Dr. Newkirk and I have discussed, you know, individual cases like this and, and, and we've discussed, but it's not, I don't have any insight as to what his next steps in his career move or whatever else, so, whatever yeah. his next direction would be. So he's officially retired. He doesn't have an office. Uh, he does do occasional video consultations with patients. They're occasional. He does still make the vest, but uh, he's just not, um, you know, he's retired. So it's a slow process. So again, if you reach out to us through the website, we can connect you with him. Um, we, we can't say much about his schedule. He's retired and he deserves it. Uh, he still loves TOS, but um, we're not really kept apprised of his day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week status. So it's worth a try to reach out to him and we'll help you connect with him uh, through our website, please. Thank you both. Humanity first. I have also been diagnosed with Tarloff cysts, but I think there's more since I, okay. So Tarloff cysts are asymptomatic, right? Or well, I would say the vast majority are asymptomatic. Sometimes they're not really a Tarloff cyst, they're an arachnoid cyst, and sometimes they are symptomatic, and sometimes they rupture and become a spinal fluid leak source. Hmm. And so I, I would say I've seen the whole spectrum. Uh, the, I would say 95 to 99% of all Tarloff cysts I see, I just make an incidental note of it in my report that I generate, and we move on because there's no symptom and there's no, no treatment required. Um, but every now and then, especially sometimes in the sacral area, if they have sacral symptoms and that's the only thing that we find, we may mm -hmm. dig deeper and sometimes an injection will suggest that there's a Good. point of compression in the Tarloff cyst, especially inside this, the relatively rigid sacrum, it may be causing irritation on a nerve. Um, How do you separate out a Tarloff cyst from an arachnoid cyst? From that. So it's, it's, it's tough. So it's... The details matter. Art, how do you uh, differentiate a Tarloff cyst from an arachnoid cyst? <laughs> That's it? a great question. Usually by opening them up and seeing, well, was it an arachnoid cyst or a Tarloff cyst causing the symptoms? Okay. Because when I read MRIs, I don't distinguish between them. And I was hoping I wasn't missing something important clinically. Uh, honestly, I think the best way to look at it is the vast majority of arachnoid cysts are going to be much more in the middle of the canal. And the Tarlov cysts are when it's out into the periphery. Um, right. But there are some people who have, you know, as you know, relatively lower areas of the common uh, canal that's within the, the dura. The dura goes particularly low, maybe S2 or even S2-3. Mm -hmm. um, and so they may, that might be more of an arachnoid cyst where you would more commonly see a Tarlov cyst. So Thank you. For me, it's more if it's past the main dural sleeve. It's if it's past if it's past the goalie, if it's past the dura, it's a Tarlov cyst. And sometimes it can be on the outside of the nerve, but on the inside of the canal, and be almost difficult to differentiate on the on the axial images. So, got it. All right. Wow. So. Um... First of all, Art, thank you again for a great talk. I didn't even get to ask some of my questions about it. I'll save those for next time. Um, <laughs> thanks to all our viewers for coming here. And I know you all hit like and subscribe, and you're all going to Instagram and liking us too. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the great questions. Uh, it's really nice of you to share with us and to ask really good questions. And I never cease to be amazed by um, how much you have learned for yourselves already, which we strongly encourage. Uh, Jenkins Neurospines in New York City. 
Art is great to talk to. He's smarter than he looks here, even. He's always <laughs> impressing me with. I never argue with anybody who says that. <laughs> We're really, no, Art, I'm really grateful to have you on. It's always stimulating for me. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy uh, from California, Sunnyvale. And um, come to us at www.tosmri.com. I will be giving a talk, a live stream in two weeks, an updated anatomy of TOS, which I love to talk about. And we hope you'll all attend and bring your other friends there. Help us out on uh, this channel. Uh, help us get enough hits to get over a thousand subscribers on YouTube. I hope you all do great. And we'll see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. Good luck and be safe. Be well.